We're starting early. Not even 10K yet. <laughs> All right, take your time. Settle in. As some of you may know, I'm Sam Zunkel and Mike Stalka. Uh, I worked for NASA for 33 years. I retired in December. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into NASA and what I did there and then eventually talk about our new space launch system. It's, this is a great poster to show the big room. Uh, but anyway, eventually I'll get to that. Um, so I went to school at the University of New Mexico. I was uh, a civil engineer, uh, roads and bridges, but I was interested in structural analysis. So when I graduated, um, I was working part-time at the Air Force Weapons Lab in Albuquerque. I, and they hired me full-time because I couldn't find another job somewhere. So I was analyzing buried missile silos, the structural analysis of silos and how the dirt uh, affects them when nuclear blast hits. And I wasn't real thrilled working on nuclear weapons, but it was a job. And uh, when I was a senior, I had, in college, I had applied for, applied an interview with NASA, but never offered me a job. And after I started working at the Air Force Weapons Lab, about three months later, NASA called and said, hey, you want to come work for us? And so I said, let's see, either work on the space shuttle or nuclear weapons. I said, I think I'd rather work on the space shuttle. <laughs> so we packed up and moved to Alabama. And um, what I do there, or did there at that time, was what we call stress analysis. It's usually structural analysis, but it's concentrating on somebody else tells me how fast things accelerate and what kind of vibrations they're exposed to, and then I use that information and calculate what happens to a structure. So everything that flies on a space shuttle or on any rocket has to survive the launch environment. And not only do you have the acceleration from the launch environment, but you've got a lot of vibrations and also acoustic, the loud noise actually causes it to vibrate. And so everything that launches has to go through stress analysis and be sure that it's strong enough to survive, and also, strong enough so that when it gets on orbit, it will function. Because you don't want to fly a piece of junk that ends up there and it's broken. You also want to make sure that it's not going to break apart to hurt the astronauts or go flying around. Since we're launching at that time on the shuttle, you don't want it flying around loose in your payload bay. So I was working on stress analysis of um, space lab payloads. Those are things that were in a big uh, module that flew in the payload bay of the shuttle. Um, and then when Space Station came along, uh, our branch and another branch were responsible for the structural analysis of all the payloads that went up to Space Station. Um, also, we worked on some other things like the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, then um, I started working on the Chandra Space Telescope. Don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's the X-ray telescope that's orbiting. Um, it was designed the last five years. It's been up 18 years. And it's giving us pictures that are very similar to what you see from the Hubble. Um, the Hubble uh, looks at mostly visible light, takes pictures in visible light. The Chandra takes pictures in X-ray wavelengths. Um, and many times you'll see a picture that say, wow, that's a great Hubble picture, but it's actually a Chandra picture. Because you see different things in visible light or X-ray wavelength. Um, and actually, we've got a third telescope that I'm going to just touch on, but not in a whole lot of detail, called the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's going to be able to um, see infrared light. And it actually is going to launch in October of next year. It's being built, actually it's been built, it's being um, integrated into the launch vehicle in California by our prime, lock, our prime uh, contractor, Lockheed Martin. And it's going to launch all folded up in the nose cone of an Ariane 5, which is a European Space Agency rocket that launches out of uh, French Guiana um, near the equator. And it's going to go up and go into deep space, and so it's going to be looking at infrared uh, sources. And so when we get that up there, um, it'll take about six months before we start getting first light from that telescope. But we will have the Hubble Space Telescope, which can look, to, which can look at visible light. We'll have Chandra, which can look, which can look at X-ray light. And then we'll have James Webb, which can look at infrared. You combine information from all three of those when you're looking at the same thing, and you learn things you never knew. So um, I did some of the preliminary structural analysis and mirrors for that. I did a substantial amount of analysis on the 
Um, Chandler mirrors. Uh, Chandler mirrors are made of glass. Uh, the James Webb Telescope mirrors are made of beryllium, very light, stiff metal. Uh, the way that, uh, that we come up with uh, telescopes is the scientists tell us what they want to be able to see. And then the engineers say, okay, how about if we build it this way so that we can meet your need, we can meet your requirements. So I went from stress analysis, I did that for 26 years really, I did seven years of those, I worked in the optics group where I did analysis of um, large mirrors, um, optical systems. Um, after the Columbia accident, I don't know if you remember, the Columbia shuttle um, broke apart on re-entry. Um, there was some damage to it at launch, and we didn't know it was damaged, and when it was re-entering, it just fell apart because the re-entry re -entry was so hot and violent, and we had some cracks in the wings, and it actually blew apart, and the astronauts died. And they said, um, we need to have better imagery of the space shuttle when it's taking off because the problem was the foam was coming off. Foam came off and hit the wing, but we really didn't have a good picture of what happened. So NASA management told the NASA centers, figure out better ways to see what's happening. And so our team got the job to build a optical system, a high definition video camera with a tracking system and image stabilization. Um, and we started from scratch and built it in about a year and a half, it was mounted in the nose of two high altitude planes. They're called WP-57, they fly about 50,000 feet. And so what they were doing is they were circling around as the shuttle took off, and they were taking pictures of the shuttle from above, because previously all we had was cameras on the ground taking a picture of the shuttle. So we could see from above as the shuttle took off, it, the planes were flying next to it, or where they could see it. And so we got really good imagery of the shuttle from above um, so we could see if there were any more foam problems coming off. And in fact, as I noticed that uh, the recent solar eclipse that we had, um, there were scientists who used that same imaging system with updated um, cameras to fly in the path of the, solar, the totality of the eclipse. And so they actually got about four and a half minutes of totality by flying, following the eclipse using the image stabilization system that we developed uh, for the experiment 10, 15 years ago, something like that. So after I did uh, stress analysis for space station payloads and worked on the Chandra, um, then I moved over to the optics group. I worked on that. I worked on a couple other programs. And then I moved back into the stress group um, when the Constellation program came up. So Constellation was going to be deep space exploration uh, because the space shuttle program was coming to an end. And then some political things and got uh, modified things. So the Constellation program kind of stopped and turned into what we call the SLS, the Space Launch System. Um, and that's what I worked on for the last four years before I um, retired. So the shuttle worked, uh, was functioning for 25 years. We launched all the parts for the International Space Station via the shuttle. Um, and of course, the Russians also launched some, some modules and nodes and things like that. So uh, that's why we call it International Space Station, because Europeans, Russians, Japanese, we all work together to get the space station up. So that's up. It's uh, functional. The space shuttle program came to an end in 2011. And NASA said, you know, we're going to stop flying the shuttle. We're going to get back into um, deep space exploration that kind of NASA started in. And the reason we felt we could do that is because it's clear that there are companies that are developing commercial launch capability. SpaceX, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada, Boeing, companies like this. Um, so what NASA said is uh, NASA put out a request for proposals got, I think, eight proposals from different companies and said this is how they would develop launch capabilities. NASA looked at it and said, okay, you five, you guys have the best ideas. We'll give you some money. Take this off and go off and improve your designs for how you build rockets. And then they came back after a while and said, okay, this is how we do it. And NASA said, okay, out of you five, you two, which turned out to be SpaceX and Boeing, you guys have the 
best proposals. So we're going to give you a bunch of money to go off and help you develop your rocket systems. So NASA is helping pay these commercial launch vehicle companies to develop their launch capability. And NASA has committed to buy launch services from those two companies for flights, cargo flights to take cargo to space station, two flights to take astronauts to and from space station. Because NASA's getting out of the business of flying to low Earth orbit. That's what we did with the space shuttle. And we're getting back into deep space exploration. So we are very happy that SpaceX and Boeing and these other companies are developing launch capabilities. Now, of course, the way this is being done is very similar to the way NASA has done things in the past. Um, for instance, in the moon program, the Apollo program, NASA knew that we were going to be sending astronauts to the moon, and they wanted to be able to drill down into the moon and take samples of the, the dirt and the rocks. But they needed to have um, a cordless drill, a powerful cordless drill that could drill down into the lunar surface. And there was nothing that existed like that. Now, Black and Decker made some small cordless tools, but nothing like that. And so NASA went to Black and Decker and said, this is what we need. Can you develop it? And Black and Decker said, yeah, we think so. And NASA said, let us give you some money to help you develop it. So Black and Decker took that money, took some of their own money, and they wrote some software that helped them design very energy efficient motors. And then they used that software and they developed very efficient motors, put it into a drill, created a drill that met the requirements that NASA needed. NASA took it to the moon and has been using those kind of cordless drills ever since. Black and Decker then took that technology, turned around, and put it into portable vacuum cleaners and all the portable drills and things that we have on the market today, the hand, the cordless drills. So that's how NASA helped spur technology development. It's not that NASA invents stuff. NASA tells industry, we need to be able to do this. Can you invent it? Or if you want to tackle it, we'll give you some money to work on it. You invent it, we'll buy it from you. And then you can turn around and sell that technology in consumer products or however when you want to use it. So getting back to SpaceX and Blue Origin and those guys, NASA is very happy for them to develop commercial launch capabilities so we can buy our rides to space station from these launch companies. And the reason I mention that is because not only do people like me, stress analysis, work for NASA, but they also work for these other companies. And not only the commercial launch companies, but a lot of the big aerospace companies like Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed Martin, there are people that do exactly what I do working for those companies. And in fact, our new space launch system, the contractors actually build the hardware. We give them the money, we help them. We develop some stuff in-house, in but these aerospace companies are very involved in all the projects that NASA does because NASA doesn't have all the capabilities to go out and build everything. So my point here is, if you want to work in aerospace, you don't have to work for NASA. You can work for NASA, but you could work for one of these other companies. Um, and if you want to work for SpaceX, they're kind of lean and mean and kind of on the cutting edge. and very exciting, it's a relatively small company, but you can still be working on rockets and space stuff, working for that company. So, it's, I just was very lucky to get in working for NASA. Um, like I said, I'd much rather work on the space shuttle than nuclear weapon systems. Uh, but that's what got me in and that's what I've been doing. So the last four years, like I said, I've been working on the space launch system. It's the new rocket that NASA is developing. Um, and this is a, like I said, a terrible picture. I didn't think about bringing a poster. But it's a big rocket in the middle with two solid rocket boosters on the side. So when the shuttle program stopped and Congress and NASA administrator told us workers we want to build a new rocket, they said there's three key criteria that have to be met. Affordability, affordability, and affordability. <laughs> So, yeah, that's what we said. And then they said, no, we're serious. The, the space shuttle program, when it was first envisioned, was going to fly a lot more often than it really did. It was supposed to fly like once every six or eight weeks. Okay? Like every two months, we're going to launch a shuttle. 
But it turns out that it's a lot more expensive and a lot more difficult to do. Um, and so it costs a lot more. And when they saw this, when we started this new program, they said, let's try to learn from our mistakes. One of the things that costs a lot of money in the shuttle program was the fact that we had a standing army, um, that's what we call people who are always on the, on the payroll, but may not be working on something really intense right now. Uh, one of the reasons is when the shuttle took off, it had two solid rocket boosters on the side, and then a um, external tank in the middle, and the orbiter was on top of the external tank. But when it launched, the solid rocket boosters would burn for two minutes and then separate and fall down into the ocean, and then they would be retrieved. And we had these great big ships and um, divers and all kinds of crews. They'd go out and they'd capture these out of the water, and they'd bring them back to Kennedy Space Center, and they'd clean them out and refurbish them, send them off to the factory, um, ATK Orbital in Utah. They would refill them with propellant, and we'd reuse those again. But all of that process of retrieval and uh, refurbishment was really expensive. Uh, now, the external tank that's in the middle of the orbiter, it would go all the way to space, and then the orbiter would, orbiter would separate from it, and it would fall back into the atmosphere, break apart and burn up, and fall into the ocean. So part of it was reusable, and of course the orbiter landed on runways when it was finished with its mission, so it was reusable. But then we had a lot of refurbishment and maintenance to do on the orbiter. So they said, okay, on the space launch system, which is desi designed to go eventually to Mars and beyond, um, let's try to figure out the cheapest way to do it. And we said, well, we know how to build solid rocket boosters. We've been doing it for 25 years. So we're going to use those same solid rocket boosters, make them a little bit longer so they're a little more powerful. The external tank in the middle um, is the same kind of tank that we had on the shuttle. That is, a ox liquid oxygen tank and a liquid hydrogen tank. So we just used that and beefed it up, make it a little bit stronger. We had 18 leftover space shuttle engines. The shuttle has three engines per orbiter. Well, the engines are reusable, so we had 18 of those left over. We'll take four of those and mount them on the bottom of the external tank. And now that becomes a rocket stage in itself. It's called core stage. So we're using engines we know, technology on the tanks that we know, solid rocket boosters that we know. And then we said, you know, the Apollo Saturn guys really had the right idea. Put your people up at the top. Because if there's anything happening down below, catching fire like the, or blowing up like the Challenger did or something. We want our people up on top so they can be, they can be taken away from the bad things very quickly. Um, and so just like on Apollo, up on top there's a rocket, um, looks like a needle sitting up on top of it. It's called the Launch Abort System. And if something happens and they fire that, it will pull the crew module, which is up at the top, away from the vehicle in about two seconds and just tremendous acceleration go out there and it's far enough away so that it won't be affected by the explosion. So we said, and of course if there's any, there's still foam on the outside of the um, core stage hydrogen tank, oxygen tanks, because those are cryogenic temperatures, um, minus 200 degrees essentially in that area. Um, and so you have to have insulation, otherwise the stuff will blow off, boil off, but the insulation sometimes peels off when the rocket's taking off. Well, if you don't have people put down there, if the foam comes off, it won't hurt anybody like it did on the Columbia, so you won't damage anything. So that's the configuration of our space launch system. Um, it is uh, 322 feet tall. Um, the first launch will be in November of 2019, two years from now. Uh, since it's a brand new rocket, uh, we're not putting people in it because we, we want to make sure everything works right. Uh, we've got instrumentation all over it. The crew module up at the top will not have people in it that have instrumentation, data recorders, things like that. It's going to take off from Kennedy Space Center. That's our launch complex for all of our launches. It will go up, <coughs> excuse me, as in the shuttle, the solid rocket boosters will burn for two minutes. They'll drop off and they'll drop into the ocean and sink. Then six and a half minutes later, the core stage will have burned out. It's going to separate from the um, crew module and the upper stage, so there's a small rocket attached to the crew module. It'll separate, and the core stage will drop down, it'll, down into the atmosphere, 
break apart and sink into the ocean. Generally, the Indian Ocean, because that's least uh, populated. And then we have the um, crew module, and actually behind the crew module is what's called the service module. So obviously the crew module where the people are, the service module that's attached to it, has the equipment for power and navigation and water and um, all the computers and things like that. No, not the computers. They're in the crew module. But um, anyway, and then the, there's an upper stage that will fire and take that assembly toward the moon, and then it will separate, and the crew module and service module will go toward the moon, just like we did in Apollo. It'll go to the moon, it'll go into an orbit around the moon, it'll stay there for about six days, we'll check out all of our um, systems, um, take all kinds of data, radio it back to the ground to make sure all of our systems work. Then after six days, it will come back to the Earth, it'll re-enter, and uh, be a fiery ball, just like the Apollos were, because they've got, you know, when you come through the atmosphere, it's pretty hot, but we've got a heat shield on the bottom that it protect it. Land in the water, the Navy will um, recover the astronauts in the capsule, take it back, and then over the next three years, we'll build another one, and this time we'll put the crew, the um, crew support equipment, the, uh, the water and air and all of the things that you need to keep people alive into the module this time. And uh, then we'll launch it about three years after the first launch. Take about, I don't know if it's going to be two or four people, I'm not the one who's in charge, but it takes some people around the moon again for six days and check out all the systems, make sure everything's working, and then come back, <coughs> re-enter and land in the water again. At that point, we will have checked out the rocket and the crew module and say we have a system now that we can do anything we want to with capability so we're developing the capability and then there are other people higher up who figure out what we're going to do with it and one of the things we can do since this rocket is very powerful is take things like habitation modules that could be used for going to Mars um, the, also we're using a what's called a block system for development so the first rocket, the first iteration, will be able to lift 70 tons. Um, the next iteration will be able to lift 105 tons. And then the final iteration will be able to lift 130 tons, which is more than any rocket ever been made. When you get to that point, you now have the ability to take things like, like I said, habitation modules, propulsion modules, that will get you to the Mars. Um, this is like in the 2020s, 2030s time zone. Uh, time frame. Getting to Mars is difficult. It's a lot more difficult than getting to the moon. And depending on what trajectory and, and approach you use, it can take, if you use the most power, it takes four to eight months to get to Mars. And so one of the concepts is we take all of the habitation modules, all the propulsion modules, all the life support, everything that you need to keep people alive for a couple of years on Mars, launch it in the SLS so it's around the moon. And you can have make several launches, put several pieces up there, they all dock, they stage and collect around the moon where there's a very, <coughs> very stable um, gravity uh, orbit, uh, an orbit around the moon that's very stable, doesn't require a lot of power to stay there. Put everything together there, then get our, launch our people up, the people get on board and go to Mars from there. And so you're taking with you not just a crew module that you can live in for six days or ten days or whatever, but a whole, almost like a space station that can land on Mars. Um, so that's one concept. Another concept of going to Mars is you build this stuff and then you send it without people to Mars. There's another way to get there that takes a lot less power, but it takes two or three years to get there. Um, we could also launch straight from Earth to go to Mars, but you can't lift very much uh, at one time because you need to have a lot of infrastructure. You've seen pictures of possible Mars bases. There's not just one little thing there. There's usually three or four or five things. So, because when you go to Mars, you've got to take everything that you're going to ever need for two or three years. Because it takes that long for the planets to align enough for you to get a return mission back. So, what we are doing is we're building the capability, the rocket, the crew module, and we're also learning as we go along, developing new systems, new life support systems. Um, and part of what's going on in space station, excuse me, part of what's going on in space station right now, 
is we're developing technology, learning what it takes to have people live in space for a long time and how to uh, keep them healthy and alive and strong. Um, you may not know this, but the astronauts actually have to have at least two hours of exercise every single day on the space station. Uh, because in, in orbit, in zero gravity, your bone density drops. Your body absorbs calcium out of your bones and your bones get weak. Your muscles atrophy. You're not using them to fight gravity. And so your muscles just get really weak. Well, if you've got astronauts flying to Mars for four months or eight months, and they don't do anything, when they land on Mars, they're not even going to be able to stand up, even in weak Mars gravity. So we've learned that you've got to have exercise. You've got to keep the body going. Space station, they've got a treadmill. They've got a, a resistance weight system, uh, or exercise system that's like a weight system, except it uses resistance. Um, you've got a stationary bicycle. And the, the astronauts do exercise, like I said, at least two hours a day. Um, Recently, Mark Kelly and Scott Kelly, a couple of astronauts who were twins. Um, Scott was on orbit for a year. His brother was on the ground. And they tech took lots of um, blood samples and measurements between the two twins to see how things change from a year on the ground and a year in orbit because they're identical twins. And so they learned a lot about human physiology in low, um, low Earth orbit and microgravity. Uh, so we're, we're developing technologies and learning things about what it takes to keep people alive on the way to Mars and even on Mars. Um, by the way, we're handing out stickers, NASA stickers. Um, I, I, am, yeah, I, I guess everybody's got one. If you don't, raise your hand. We'll pass them out. Um, I will say I'm responsible for bringing the stickers here. You're responsible for not putting them where they don't belong. Okay? <laughs> and it's and, and what, oh yeah, there's, there's enough for one apiece, if you would, please. Um, I will tell you that they're, they're very durable stickers. You stick it on, it won't be coming off. So if you think you might want to put it somewhere else, you might just put some tape on the back or a magnet on the back and kind of move it wherever you want. Um, but anyway, these are what we call the NASA meatball. That's the logo that we use right now. So I, I worked on this uh, for four years, Space Launch System. Um, one of the things that you do when you launch a new rocket is you do a whole bunch of structural analysis, dynamic analysis, say, hey, this is what we think is going to happen when we fly. Um, how's the vehicle going to behave? There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of temperature, there's a lot of vibration. Um, one of the things we learned from our early analysis was with our preliminary design, the crew module was going to be so noisy that it would have damaged the astronauts' ears, not only their hearing, but actually like bloody ears. And so they modified the design so that the noise going through the atmosphere is not going to be so loud for the astronauts. Um, so what I and my team were responsible for doing was figuring out where we wanted to have sensors on the vehicle when we launched. So you predict what's going to happen, and then you measure what's going to happen. And you compare that with what you predicted. And uh, so I got our team together, and we had people from all the different disciplines. And we said, OK, where do you guys need sensors on the vehicle? And we came back and we ended up with about 6,000 sensors. And we said, um, that's a problem because the electronic system that we've got that's going to take data from these, uh, we can only handle 1,200 sensors instead of 6,000. And of course, everybody said, my gosh, I can't do my job if I don't get that kind of data. We said, well, let's sit down and look at who wants what where. And we realized that the aeroacoustics guy wanted a pressure measurement here, but the um, aerothermal guy wanted the pressure sensor, you know, eight inches away. And said, okay, look, why don't we consolidate these and move one in the middle and get one off the list. So we went through four iterations like that, and we got down to about 1,200 sensors. Um, and I said <coughs> early on, it became very clear that a successful compromise is when everybody is equally unhappy. <laughs> so that's where we are right now. The analysts say, you know, I'm not going to get enough data from the flight in order to do my job. We said, I'm sorry, that's the affordable avionic system that we were given. We have to fit within the limitations we were given. So we got that stable. Um, we're now building hardware. They're starting to install sensors. Um, we run into things like, well, there's a sensor buried way down in there, but we just found out that it's dead. And so the team has to, our team, the team I was on, uh, has to say, okay, well, how important is that sensor? Is it worth spending 
150, 200 thousand dollars taking the computer, I mean the, the rocket apart to get to that put a new one in there, or can we manage to just leave it there um, and fly with it dead? So that's the kind of things that the team is working on, and I said, you know, I'm gonna let you guys work on it. I've been here 33 years, I'm gonna step off and enjoy my vacation, visit, enjoy my retirement, come around and see people we haven't seen for a long time. This we live in Alabama. And we're on an eight-week trip, driving trip around the country, and we stopped in here. And we said, hey, you want to come talk to some people? I said, sure. Because one of the things I do in my retirement in Alabama, in Huntsville, we have the U.S. Space or the Internet, yeah, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, which is a big space museum. And I volunteer my time there, and I walk around and talk to people about the, all the things I worked on, all the rockets on display, the space telescopes, and things like that. Um, very much is what I'm doing here, uh, answering questions. Um, and talking to people about NASA. So NASA is still very business, very busy. NASA is developing rockets to go into deep space, asteroid capture, Mars, deep space. We're building the capability to, for people of your generation to go out and explore space. So at that point, I think we have a few minutes left. Yeah. Yep. Questions. And Michael, let yes. them know that you're at lunch too if they want to ask questions. Yes, like I'll be coming back at lunch um, wherever we are. I'll be available here, whatever. I'll be available. Um, anybody that has questions or wants to talk further for now, we'll just plan to meet in my room. Okay. That's fine. We're going to meet in his room <laughs> at lunch, right? <laughs> lunch you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 12 30. Okay. Questions? Tell them you don't have to be an engineer. Yes. Okay. So. Um, I told you my background is civil engineering, which is roads and bridges. And uh, when NASA came to um, interview at my college, they were looking for mechanical engineers. And I walked in to the interview and I said, I know you're interviewing mechanical engineers. I'm a civil engineer, but I want to work for NASA and here's why you ought to hire me. Because my expertise is in structural analysis, which is what sometimes some of the things that mechanical engineers do. So uh, you don't have to be an aerospace engineer. You, NASA hires all kinds of disciplines. I mean, uh, Peggy Whitson, who just came off being a, an astronaut for a year, she's a uh, botanist, I think. Um, we've got chemists. We've got all kinds of, pretty much any of the disciplines, um, science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM disciplines. There's a place for you at NASA or in one of our support contractors. Um, so uh, and. and the really cool thing about working at NASA anyway is if you get into an area and you say, you know, this just really isn't for me, you talk to people and very often you can transfer to other departments. And so you can end up doing uh, lots of interesting things, uh, which kind of leads me to another thing. There's a co-op program at NASA, which uh, when you're in college, you go to school for a semester, work full-time for a semester, go to school for a semester, work full-time for a semester. Um, there's also a uh, summer intern program, um, and I think it's a paid intern program, I don't know. Um, NASA.gov, website there, they have all kinds of information. That's just like the beginning, you go all down different levels. Um, intern program works really well. Uh, we've had several summer interns in our uh, branch when I was working there. In fact, I have been helping me develop a database system to help track and, man and manage all of these measurements, these 1,200 measurements I'm talking about. Started from scratch. He learned to use database software, and then he, he and I worked together to build this database. So it's a real good experience. Uh, you get a taste of what it's like to work at NASA. And then um, what they do is, at NASA, when we, we're talking about interns, the word goes out and says, who, who has a job for NASA? <laughs> How fast can you get through all the things you want to say? Yeah. Oh, thinking like an engineer. Thank you. Well, I run sound too for a couple bands. There you go. So I know about tripping hazards. There you go. <laughs> I was going to try to have you come to physics first period, but communications didn't happen. Yeah, okay. yeah, last minute kind of thing.
we hope to be back here eventually. We'll try to make it. Yeah, yeah. 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 And this is Michael. Or this is Ben. This is Michael. Yeah, nice this is Sam's best friend. Okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. This is Jill. Hi. Hi. Nice yeah, to my wife. <laughs> so, there's the shuttle. And that's SLS, and Saturn V is just a little bit taller. This is block one, right. and then when we go to block two, it's actually going to be taller than that. Oh, cool. I improved uh, higher strength <coughs> rockets and improved engines. That's impressive. So it's, they, they use the block program. The Saturn program is the same way. You start out small, you build it, you test it. You right. make a bigger win, you build it, you test it, mm -hmm. and gradually improve the capabilities. That's awesome. But the uh, lift capability is, is pretty big on this thing. To get a picture of it. Can I hold it up? That's great. Thank you. These, uh, all these graphics are on the NASA website. You, know, you can go find it. These, these are all handouts. There's huge amounts of uh, um, educational resources. And you can actually download them. Yes, you can download them. And in fact, I've got uh, business cards in my briefcase uh, from the Teacher Resource Center that we have. Um, so I leave a few of those here, and you can just if you want to call and talk to somebody. Especially with physics, there's probably some pretty great oh, yeah. stuff oh, yeah. that you yeah. could get. With. Yes. There is. <laughs> yeah, I wish it's, we had. Are you Mr. Boss? I am. I'm Brenda Johnson. Nice to meet you. I'm Sam John's mom and Rachel John's mom. Tell you what, I'll leave you those, and you can share those with whoever needs them. Um, and there are places on the website where you can request information. You can also download if you want, you know, pretty graphics like this on hard paper. They'll mail it to you. But you can also download it. And generally, the astronauts are available to come and speak to schools as well. Just yeah. yeah, there was a, um, I think he flew on the ISS from Spokane. Who okay, did that. yeah. yeah. He, yeah. Did he come and visit? He w not here, but several of the regional yeah. schools. Oh, and and if you may have to wait for them to have an opportunity, but they are so enthusiastic. And, and oh, yeah. It's just... There are so many people who don't know that NASA is and we decided that as we travel, we're going to try and make opportunities to, to speak to people. When we, this, we're cousins, and so I, I knew he was coming for months, but it just never crossed my mind that Charter might like to have him come talk. <laughs> and then yesterday, I'm, he's explaining stuff, I'm like, oh my goodness, these kids would love this. So, That's so cool. I know. Well, you know, Thank you've got to get so to class. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have some good Appreciate friends it. that worked at JPL, and, ah. and some college buddies that worked on Cassini and other things. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. In fact, um, shall we unplug this? Yeah, okay. just throw it aside. It's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know the present status of Cassini? Cassini was it's about the Saturn. plunge. It is. It's yeah. about the plunge. Cassini's been orbiting Saturn, doing all kinds of stuff for like 12 years, I think. Went through the ring for the last time. Yep, and, and, and it's, it's running out of propellant. And NASA doesn't like like leave space junk around Earth or Saturn, and so <laughs> what they're going to do is they're going to command it to go down, plunge into the atmosphere, and take data as it goes, yeah, and, and, and send the data back as long as it can. But eventually, the atmosphere is going to crush it and kill it. Wow. But it'll take it'll be taking data that nobody's been able to take before because you're going down in. through the atmosphere of Saturn. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, that's just a few days away. Yeah, yeah. it's the yeah. end of this week. Thank you so much for making this happen. Yeah, yeah. I so sure appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Do you mind us taking over your room at No, Michelle? that's great. That's, okay. fine. that's fine. So when will a human make a footprint on Mars? Um, it's it's not my choice. It's their choice. <laughs> it's your your well, thirty years guess. of experience. So, so NASA NASA happen? administrators and uh, say say that. <laughs> He will never commit no. anything. <laughs> the 2030s is when we think that things will have evolved enough and matured enough and will have the technology and the systems that we think we can support astronauts on Mars. It'll be in the 2030s. Robert Lightfoot is current head of NASA. And his last statement was, the goal is to do it by 2032. Okay. The goal. So, the goal. so NASA has goals and NASA has requirements. <laughs> right. And a goal is we really hope to do it. A requirement is you must do it, or there are going to be penalties. Well, we made 1969. That's right. We did. Was that the, was that okay? The so that was for that one. But By the end of the, the decade. That yep. That's goal? what Kenny so said. So the the thing I want to point out that I didn't mention here, but I will now, 
is that NASA has lots of programs, you know, Space Launch System, Cassini, all the Mars rovers, all the aeronautic development that we do, the telescopes. Um, all the Earth observing, you know, Space Telescope, Chandra, James Webb, um, Space Science, Earth observing telescopes, um, not the GPS, but that's military, but all the other things that we do that are looking at global warming and climate change and all that. The entire NASA budget is four tenths of one percent of the federal budget. We do all of that on four tenths of one percent of the federal budget. This is so, so NASA it's is still there, but we don't have the budget yeah, like when it got to when we, the moonshot was going on. I think it was like seven percent of the national yeah. budget. Wow! So it's dropping. it was a huge commitment by the whole country because we had to meet the Russians and to the moon. Were excited. People were yes. excited by it. Yes. Yeah. So, so you can point that out. You know, but we were talking before, you don't have to even be in the sciences that you were talking about. You could be a dietitian. There's medical people that are needed. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, the it's fine. Johnson Space Center has a whole division to deal with food for astronauts, develop new foods and, and um, not only preserving it, but also making recipes that taste good in zero gravity because it's your body changes in zero gravity. The, the, the air there and also the gravity affects your taste buds and things are not mm -hmm. quite as tasty. And so one of the real popular things with the astronauts is things like hot sauce or, or things that are spicy because it's easier to taste. Um, and that was learned <laughs> from experience. And so the, the Johnson Space Center has this division that deals with the food. And the astronauts go in and say, this is the kind of stuff I like. Here's a recipe I like at home. Can Make you convert it, it to in space? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Vacuum-packed sushi on really? board. Oh, yeah. The, 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 yeah. Astronauts and, and <laughs> from different countries, astronauts from different countries bring, like to bring their own favorite foods, and they share on space station. You know, they're very oh, collegial on station. Yeah. Well, I think about so, just yeah. airlines, how the airline industry has tried to make food taste yep. better in the air. It's a sim it's similar situation. Yeah. There's, there's some, it affects your taste buds in yeah, the air. Interesting. Yeah, so there's, there's all kinds of opportunities. You don't have to be an astronaut to be in NASA. You know, there's 10,000 people on the ground for every astronaut that flies. Um, we well, did a great job. Thank you so much. I a pleasure. Fun. Very I fun enjoy too. talking about it. it. Obviously, I didn't stop. <laughs> the questions, that's what they're going to love is the okay. questions. Uh, you know, yeah, I think it would be a smaller classroom group. Classroom would be a little bit easier. Uh, yeah, and I would yeah. guess it was a smaller group of probably 20 or so. But you had, you had 96 here. Okay. Well, I'm glad they were able yeah. to come. So if you had 96 and you reached two, it would be great. <laughs> At least they got an idea of what it's yeah. like. Well, and it's yeah. fun to hear, like, what's coming. I think yeah. it's so fun yeah. to hear what's yeah. coming. Yeah, the, the James Webb Space Telescope doesn't get a lot of Are you PR, familiar, it? but it's, it's going well, to launch October of next year. Not that scope, but I was trying to get some of the infrared footage from those chase planes. Oh, okay. They haven't posted anything WB yet. No, they haven't. I, I thought it'd be lovely to look at. But. Um, on the clips you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. 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 Um, and it was a guy at Southern for Research. Micro flares and yes, stuff. the micro yeah, flares and the corona. I yeah. I, I was really pleased when I saw they're using the, the stabilized platform is, that we have for our system. They're still using the system. <laughs> yeah, of course they've refined it since right. then, put new cameras on and stuff like but that. Still, but the but idea it's, of it. It's in yeah. the nose and, and they can. And what was cool is they were flying, they had two planes and right. one was ahead of the other. The and as the nice. eclipse came along, the eclipse moves faster than the planes. Right. So the one in back gets the data first, you know, taking the imagery oh, first, the and then the eclipse outruns it, and but the next one's right in, that's and, it, really and it just cool. continues. So they and end up with they two planes minutes. flying with it. They got eight minutes. Eight though. minutes, yeah, it was like wow. seven and 39 or something like yeah. that, yeah. Wow. And, and totality was two minutes and 40 seconds right. on the ground. Which that's the most so you get. Cool to be able to have yeah. that much data. Yeah, and there were, the, the particular um, scientific investigator uh, was they're trying to figure out why the corona is so hot and there's this thing called micro flares that they think are there but you can't really see it you do, but, but when the they observe it when the, hotter than the sun. yeah the corona yeah, is like millions of degrees yeah, like, and the sun's like see. thousands of degrees like, how does that happen? they don't know and yeah. they think that micro flares may be contributing to the heating mm. and so you can't see the micro flares because you can't see the corona because the sun's so hot but when you get a total eclipse you get it hides the disk of the sun and you can it. see yeah and I think he said um, I guess Nova had a show about the eclipse and he was on there for a little mm. bit um, real time they were watching and he says we got some data from it we saw oh, cool. I don't know if there are micro flares captured but yeah 
Because it's so, so they will have learned Yeah, but you, you can only... And the other thing they studied when there was a... a one of the other things they studied when it was a total eclipse was Mercury. Right. Because you so can't see Mercury true. because it's between us and the sun. Right. And it's so close to the sun, you can't observe it. Well, now the sun's blocked off for see, a few minutes, so you can look, look at Mercury. Oh, I didn't even see They were looking at the that. temperature transition from cold to hot as it slowly rotates doing. and trying to get the, wow, the, that's so yeah, cool. the composition of the soil. Isn't that amazing? And, it's and, so it close to us, but you can't see it. A little yeah. window of pants. Yeah. 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 We have, cool. we have to check out this telescope, the one that they're about yeah. to. The James Webb. James Webb. Yep. He was explaining to us this morning. It's it's a really well, cool. It, it's well, I've enjoyed the Chandra pic yeah. picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Years, so. One of the things that I wanted to get a picture, but I didn't really get to it this morning. The Pillars of the Creation was a Hubble mm -hmm. Space Telescope picture, you know, classic. There's also one that combines imagery from the Chandra and the Hubble. Right. So you've got X-ray sources on top of that. Right. And one of the things I point out, like I mentioned today, is once you get the James Webb on there, it will be able mm -hmm. to look at infrared, and you combine that with the other two sources, and you see things that you never thought you'd right. see. So even know are there, which will be fun. Yeah. yeah. And that's October of 18. October 2018, 2018 is a scheduled yeah. launch date. Yeah. Right. And probably by the end of the year, they'll have, they'll have photos. Yeah. It, it, Who's putting it up? Um, Ariane, um, ESA is launching it. European oh, oh, Space Agency right. is launching it on Ariane 5 because Ariane 5 is pretty much the heaviest lift rocket. Um, and we did a quid pro quo with ESA. They'll launch it and we'll give them like observing time and things like that. Um, and it launches from French Guiana, uh, which is like the northeast corner of South America, very close to the equator. So it's very efficient launching near the equator because you get the, the spin yes. of the Earth. <laughs> really, yeah. Well, yeah. Come there as fast as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the SLS rocket were flying, it could launch the um, James Webb. Sure. But we're not to that point yet. I had the kids watch the SpaceX Air Force launch yesterday. Oh, oh good. good! Were yes. they able to land the uh, first stage? <gasps> yes. Good. So cool. yeah. See, that, that cuts like, costs. my mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, the technology and the computers have advanced to the point where you can have a, a rocket control itself and land. Uh, but, you know, it's very unstable, and you got to have fast computers when you can yeah. do that now. And they got those little, uh, they changed them to titanium. The, they used to be aluminum flaps that would come out or okay. things. They look like waffles yeah. with holes in them. And right toward the end, you can see them all doing this. <laughs> they like little gimbals. It's, it's just amazing. Really fast, too. Yeah. Computer controls. Have you been to any of the launches for either? I've never watched a launch. I was down there in the 70s, but it didn't time out to see a launch. Oh, that was, I've never well, gotten I, to see one either. I've worked on the shuttle. I started in 83, and the first launch was 81. And I had never seen a launch, and the program was coming to an end. And my, my manager said, you know, you need to get down and see it. So he arranged for me, along with a bunch of other people, every launch they had, launch VIPs, I guess it is. Yeah. And so we got down. And uh, it took us three times because the first two were scrubbed for one reason or another. Sure. So we so drive down to Florida and spend a few days. Okay, come back later. <laughs> and we actually Hunt saw. Wasn't so you guys far. No, it's, it's 16 not. Hours. It was, it was 16 hours. Yeah, because yeah, it's down and across. Um, but it, it was cool to watch the shuttle launch from. I guess it's two, two and a half miles away. Yeah. And you see it moving, and you feel. Yeah, yeah. you see it, and then I you feel it. I did not expect to be as emotional really? when it happened. Yeah. I mean, I thought this is really cool. I've always been a NASA fan, you know. But it started and it lifted off and it was just tears. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. It was. It's I mean, so it was. It was so incredible, and you feel that that rumble. I was gonna say the energy. And of it. When you're there and you're seeing it in person, you realize there are people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it changes everything from seeing it on TV. It's not just. And science. and, and it's, it's, it's I don't know if anybody happy. else does, but those of us at NASA, we watch. And we say, just hang on, SRBs keep burning because they were the problems on Challenger. And we yep. fix the problem, it's, but you never know. But when they said finally, the throttle up, the like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and when the SRBs separate and come up, everybody goes, <sighs> and they did. okay, <laughs> now we got to get to orbit. <laughs> that whole bandstand area that was there, and we were all standing there. And was we, this all NASA? Was it all? Well, well, no. It was, it was a lot just of, everybody. A lot of launch on the reefs is what they call it. was holding their breath. And when, it, when they separated and everything was fine, you heard a literal collective sigh. A sigh in the crowd, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, But that's part of it, and then the yeah. engines have to keep firing, and then yeah. get up, finally get to orbit, and it'll separate from the external tank. But that was the big thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. We enjoyed it. So everybody okay. was holding their breath on both ends, because then re-entry was also... That's oh, yes, re-entry. Re that, exactly. that was... Yeah. 
a that was the, the color may was a, a real awesome. bad and and what was unfortunate was um, politics and stuff kind of gets involved there too um, I know a guy at Johnson Space Center who was a division chief and after Columbia launched and it was on orbit he pushed really hard over and over and over to get like ground access um, ground assets to, to look at it or the military to use some of their satellites to look at it and see if there was any damage on the orbiter and he kept getting stopped and and he worked for days and finally he said I've done everything I can I hope everything's okay and then when it was re-entering and it broke apart would, it, would they have had the materials necessary to go out and do a tile repair uh probably not um so it would have been moot. i don't know exactly what they would have done it was actually it wasn't really the tiles that was damaged the leading edge of the wing has um some material that's not the not silica violent. tiles but it's a uh, it's a graphite epoxy kind of material okay. um carbon carbon fiber is really what it is so it's very heat resistant um, but it's laminate, and what happened was when the foam hit it, it delaminated, and so it was weakened. And then when you when you hit the re-entry environment, that weakened part broke away and gave let the heat get into the wing, which is just high strength aluminum, and aluminum melts at a relatively low temperature, and so it just started falling apart. And then once the wing starts falling apart, the whole thing just goes. Could they have taken longer? Could they not have re-entered when they planned to and taken more time? To um, if they you know, listened? probably what they would have done is they would have tried to dock with space station. Right? Okay, and um, so because get the space station's off. up there, yeah. right, and get the people off to space station. Yeah. And, and in fact, rescue. when yeah. we launched the um, the last one, uh, which was the um, HST last servicing mission, um, we actually had. No, the second to last one. We had two shuttles on the pad because mm. if something had happened with the primary shuttle that was doing the mission, yeah. the second shuttle was ready to go up to and rescue, rescue them. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's entirely possible that they could have maintained orbit long enough to get yeah. a people. And, and you know, they, they prob I don't think they had the docking adapter on the Columbia to dock with space station. But How if you, a mirror? Could they have gotten a mirror? Um, no, but what they probably could have done if they really had to was get on their EVA suits okay. and go from the shuttle to the space station. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah. And get in that way. Because, you know, there's EVA air, um, air locks on the shuttle and on space station, so you could have just had the people go across, across tether or something like yeah. that. Yeah, we use tethers. We don't like our astronauts floating around free. <laughs> a little scary. Yeah. Uh, but, jet pack. but, but, but <laughs> using the jetpack, everybody held their breath. I bet. Yeah. I mean, it was like, yes, they've done it. Okay, let's not do it again. It's very scary. Yeah. Now awesome. they have they have um, little cold nitrogen jets on their spacesuits when they go out in EVA. So if something happens, they can maneuver around in space. But it's like an emergency kind of thing. Backup mm -hmm. plan. Yeah, because they always have their tethers attached, yeah. and sometimes attach it here and hold on here, and then attach there. Yeah. yeah. I can't even imagine like this moment. Climber. Yes, absolutely. Climber. Hang on. I was just yeah. reattaching the tether. The hanging on moment would be like because death grip. Those gloves are so. Hard. I know that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, yes. wow. Can you imagine? Yep. If I let go, <laughs> can't can't do it for me. But, but remember that all the, anytime they go up for an EVA, for the most part, at least on the shuttle program, is they had practiced it in a neutral true. buoyancy that's tank at JSC. Over and over, that's they true. knew exactly what they were going to do and what? how they're going to do. It still takes a certain type of person with a certain mindset yeah. to do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. absolutely. Astronauts are amazing Very people. <laughs> But we probably should. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks for coming. We got the lunchtime, so kids can ask questions. Very good. Yeah. Thank you so you much. can video lunchtime too if you want. <laughs>